objective scheme over a field. And these are Cartier divisor. Then uh, I more or less uh, studied the behavior of uh, the dimensions of the multiples of, of D as M go, goes to infinity. So uh, I'll try to summarize what uh, we saw. So we, we might as well uh, look at the uh, induced rational maps associated with this uh, spaces of sections. So here we have uh, some projective space whose dimension is this number minus one. Okay, let me write nm. So the best case scenario is when uh, d is ample. When d is ample, ev everything is fine. Uh, we know that the uh, higher cohomology group vanish. So we have that th for m large enough. H naught is actually a polynomial in M of degree, so let's say that the dimension here is N. So this is a, a, a polynomial whose leading coefficient is uh, D to the N by uh, definition. Okay, so M okay. plus lower order terms. Now, uh, the next uh, case is when uh, D is big. So when D is big, we prove that this number uh, grows actually at the same uh, polynomial rate. So again, for M uh, very large, we have that <coughs> uh, this is a, uh, so this is not exactly what I proved, but, but this is still true. So. Uh, let me write, write it like this, or maybe a, little a. Okay. So this is not, it doesn't have to be a polynomial, but so let me write, write it a little bit differently, although we won't care that much. Oh, here I, I forgot to say, uh, so this number here, uh, a, is positive. Okay. So I forgot to say a very important thing with respect to this uh, morphism here that uh, we prove that they become finite and, and even, although I never proved that, they become closed embeddings. Okay. In the case where uh, uh, D is big, uh, what one can prove that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll prove it in a moment, that these morphisms here actually, uh, uh, so they have, I mean, they have no reason to be morphisms, so they're rational maps, so they induced they induced things like that. And actually, the dimension of the image is maximum. Okay, so in other words, it's generically finite and even actually birational. This is the same uh, birational onto its image. When D is, uh, in addition to being big, is nef, so if D is big and nef, then this number A here is, this, is the, this intersection number. Okay. So this number A here, I, I won't go into this, it's a whole uh, new field, uh, is actually called the volume of D. Okay, okay and uh, maybe a, a final note here, which I never mentioned, but this is very important. Whenever you, uh, if some um, multiple of D induces a morphism, okay, so that means exactly that uh, MD is base point free. So if phi MD is a morphism for some M, then D is base point free and it is in particular NF. Okay, I'll let you check that with the uh, what I did in the uh, other lectures, it's not very difficult. Okay, so uh, let me prove this. Actually, I won't prove that it's birational. Uh, I, I'll just prove that it is a, um, a gener generically finite onto its image. So the idea is, is, is very simple. If D is big, 
remember that uh, we saw that we can write D as uh, effective plus ample. And if you look, so DM will be, uh, uh, MD, sorry, will be ME plus MA. And uh, so in particular, among the sections of MD, you have the sections of MA times something, okay? So th this here, since E is effective, implies that you have an inclusion. I already used this, this uh, last time. So another way to state that is uh, to say the following, that uh, you have, if you look at the morphism, uh, no, the rational map, MD, so here, the, uh, actually the projective space, which I never wrote here, is the dual of this guy here. If you project from this dual to that dual, okay, there is a map in the reverse direction, uh, you'll obtain uh, you'll obtain the this this composition here will be the map associated with M A, which we know is a morphism for M large enough. It's even a, an embedding. Okay, so actually, if you if you uh, take this uh, for granted. I mean, if the fact that it is an embedding, it does prove that this map here is birational onto its image, okay? Because this one is an isomorphism onto its image. Okay. So this is a linear projection here. Okay, so this is sort of a summary of uh, what I did last time, and uh, it sort of justifies the, uh, the following definition of the Kodaira dimension. So same, uh, same setup for X and D. Actually, it's, uh, it's better to assume X is actually normal, normal variety. Sorry. Then we look at the uh, various uh, positive multiples of uh, D, and we look at the associated rational maps and at the dimension of their image, of their images. So this is a, and we want it to look at the maximal, maximal dimension. So max for M positive of the dimension of the image of phi MD. Okay, so it's sort of a, okay. And so of course this is less than the uh, dimension of X and this is called the uh, Codera dim dimension of of D or of X or of the pair XD, okay, Kodaria dimension. So there are uh, two extreme cases. Uh, um, so, okay. So this m this rational map is actually only defined when this space is, uh, is this number is non-zero. Okay. So it may happen that uh, all these numbers. Uh, all the, uh, these numbers here are zero, in which case these maps are never defined. So as sort of a convention, we decide that this will be negative infinity if, uh, let's say, H naught of uh, XMD equals zero for all, for all M, okay? Take that, take that as a, a definition. There's also another uh, case wh where it's easy. When is the dimension uh, zero? So whenever this, uh, so the image of this map here is never, is always non-degenerate, never contained in a hyperplane, okay? So to say that this maximum is zero means that uh, the image of this map here uh, is always a point, okay? Which can only happen if this is P zero, okay? Uh, zero-dimensional projective space. So this is equivalent to saying that the maximum for M positive of, the dim of these dimensions is one. Okay. And at, at, the, uh, at the other end of the spectrum here, we have the case where the Kodara dimension is equal to the dimension of X. 
And uh, so this is the case certainly because I just proved it for big divisors. Okay, it says that for m large enough, or for some m, but actually for all m large enough, this map here will be birational to its image, meaning that it's, this is equivalent to saying that the, the image has the same dimension as x. Okay. And it's not very difficult to see that this is equivalent to being big. Okay, and lastly I want to, uh, so there are, uh, you can say uh, much more about the structure of these maps, which I won't have time to go uh, to describe here, but uh, it's in the notes. Uh, so you have statements like this for any Kodaira dimension. You can analyze what these morphisms look like. Uh, but the, the other thing I want to mention before I uh, go to uh, another topic is the important case where, let's say that x is smooth for simplicity. So I never mentioned the uh, canonical class. So maybe it's time. Uh, so kx, I mean, it's been mentioned in uh, all the other talks, so I, I assume you know it. Uh, as a, let's say, as a invertible sheaf. So Ax of uh, Kx is the determinant of the sheaf of differentials on X. So this is a locally free sheaf of rank N. So you take the uh, maximal exterior power and you get an invertible sheaf and the associated, uh, any associated divisor is called a canonical divisor. So we can uh, use the definition that I just gave and apply it to the canonical divisor and we get what, we, what, what is called the Kodaira dimension of X. Okay, so this is by definition, so, you j so this is a, a kappa here. So by definition, this is the uh, Kodaira dimension of um, kx. Okay, so it, it describes the behavior of the sp uh, spaces of sections of multiple of the canonical class. So I, I won't say more uh, ab about that because I'm not going to use that very much. But uh, of course, this, it's an uh, essential uh, a notion in the classification of algebraic varieties. OK, so uh, I want to go uh, to a, a totally different topic. And, and this is one which, uh, and this is a conference on, of, on <coughs> moduli of curves, and I've been doing divisors all the time. So now we'll do curves. Okay, so the next chapter is called Rational Curves on Varieties. So in that chapter, you'll see curves, of course, but you'll also see uh, moduli spaces. Okay, so what is the setting? Uh, uh, we're giving a, uh, I guess, a variety, even a, a quasi-projective variety, x quasi-projective variety over a field k. You take a curve C, which is in my, uh, with my convention, smooth projective. Over K also. And uh, so we want to look at uh, morphisms from C to X. Okay, so this is what I call curves on X. But so we're keeping the, the C and X fixed. Okay, and we want to describe all morphisms uh, like that. Okay, and more exactly, we want to describe uh, the moduli space for all uh, morphisms fixing uh, C and X. Okay, so by now you all know what a moduli space is, which is nice. So. Uh, in this case, this is a very easy situation because there is a fine moduli space. So it sort of never happens uh, except <coughs> here. Okay, so uh, 
to describe uh, a modular space, you have to define what you mean by families of, uh, of morphisms. So the, this is really natural. So I put the T in here. So a family of such morphisms will be just uh, a map from C cross T to X. Okay. And uh, so you think of it as a family of morphisms parameterized by T. T is in any, any K scheme here. Okay, and uh, so to any t in t, you have a curve which stands c t to uh, I don't know f uh, f of c t. Okay, so if you fix t, if you fix a k point on t, for example, you get a, a k morphism from c to x. Okay, so the theorem, which is uh, actually was proved by Groton Dick. is that there is a fine molar space for this morphism. So let me spell out what it means. There exist a K scheme. So I'll write as uh, more from C to X. Um, locally of finite type, I'll explain uh, what the problem is here. which parameterizes uh, morphisms from C to X. So in other words, there is a universal family which is uh, as in here. It's sometimes called the evaluation map also, so I'll, I'll name it uh, EV, okay? So this is sort of a existence theorem. And now um, we describe the local structure of this guy here, the Zariski tangent space. To this uh, scheme here at a point corresponding to let's say a k point, so rho would be a, a k morphism like this, is isomorphic to the space of sections of the pullback of the tangent bundle of x to c. Okay, so this is the tangent bundle uh, to x, and uh, this is the pullback here. Uh, let, yeah, it's better if I write it this way. It's better to assume that X is smooth. Although, although uh, uh, this is actually true in more generality, but then you have to change the space a little bit. Uh, so this is a uh, Zariski tangent space, and locally around Zariski, locally around uh, this point rho. The scheme more can be defined. It's a bit long to write in a smooth uh, variety, k variety of dimension the dimension of this guy, so the dimension of the Zariski tangent space by H1 are the same sheaf equations. Okay, so it's clear. Okay, so you have a, it's sort of a, there's sort of a general statement uh, at work here. Um, So in particular, uh, the dimension at rho of the space of morphisms is greater than or equal to the dimension of this variety minus the number of equations. Okay? So this is just the Euler characteristic 
of the pullback of the tangent bundle. And now there's also a riemann roch theorem, which I only stated for invertible sheaves. Here, this is not an invertible sheaf, but it's a locally free sheaf. So there's a version of that. And uh, so uh, let me just write plus um, 1 minus g of c dim of x. Okay. So this is the, the canonical class of uh, C. This is also the first Schoen class of, uh, I mean, minus Kx is the first Schoen class of this. And so this is the uh, intersection taken in the sense that I defined um, in the other lectures. OK. So uh, it's a theorem that's uh, it's, it's long. Uh, it's actually uh, not that difficult, uh, and I'll prove it. Uh, I'll, I'll show you that it's really elementary uh, when c is equal to p1. Okay, so proof or sketch of proof when c equals p1. So you can see that uh, it's not. Uh, I mean, it's a ra rather concrete ob object. Okay, so uh, first case. Uh, not only I assume that c is equal to p1, uh, but I'll assume that x is equal to pn. So I'm looking at uh, morphisms from P1 to Pn. As you know, uh, these morphisms uh, can always describe as follows. So let me write a UV for a point in P1. And so this is obtained by the coordinates here will be homogeneous polynomials in UV of the same degrees. Okay, so F0. So these are homogeneous polynomials of the same degree. Of degree D, say. Okay, this is because any morphism like this is associated with the uh, line bundle, which is the pullback of O of 1 here to P1. So it's going to be some O of D, and then you write it this way. But there's one extra condition, not all uh, n tuples of n plus one tuples of polynomials uh, define a morphism. Uh, you need f zero f n uh, not to have any uh, common multiple. Oh, what did I say? Any common zero. Okay, so the uh, so I should add here, or maybe I can make it here with no common zero. Okay, you don't want them to vanish. No common zero over uh, algebraic closure. Okay, so uh, in some sense we want to, uh, any morphism, so You can associate this uh, number d, which is the common degree of these uh, polynomials, plus this uh, f not fn, okay, which are defined up to a multiplication by a, a non-zero uh, scalar. So this is just, uh, so how did I write it? Uh, this, is, this is an element of p of, let me write for k of u, v, D, so this, I think uh, uh, Radu used this notation, the, the sp space of polynomials, homogeneous polynomials in two variables of degree D, and so you have uh, n plus one of them. Okay. And uh, plus this extra condition of having no uh, common zero in the algebraic closure. Okay. And so, uh, Maybe I'm spending a little bit uh, too much time on this, but uh, it's very easy to see, uh, it's, it's uh, explained in the notes, that this extra condition is actually an open condition. So there's there, there will be really uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence between the morphisms and uh, 
a Zeisky open subset of this guy here. Okay? So the open uh, comes from this uh, extra condition okay, of having no common zero. So some Zariski open subset of, um, yep. Sorry? What is the, open, the extra condition? Of having no common zero. Ah, okay. yeah. I mean, it's, it's very easy. I mean, you can work over the algebraic closure and <coughs> having uh, a common zero then means having a, a common divisor and then, uh, so it, it's explained in the notes. Okay. So, um, we get some uh, uh, big open set, I mean big, open, non-empty open set in this big projective space here, okay? And uh, the scheme that, the scheme more is just the disjoint union of all these guys, okay? So each, each UD is just an uh, uh, open subset of a projective space, so it's a quasi-projective variety. This union here is not quasi-projective because it's not locally uh, of finite type, okay? So this is where this uh, uh, sort of uh, scary looking uh, world comes from. It's just that it, it's, a, it's a disjoint union of quasi-projective varieties, okay? So there's nothing to be scared of. How do you do the general case? Well, it's uh, actually uh, quite easy. If you take, assume that X is projective, so X is contained in a projective space. Okay. So it's defined by a certain number of equations. Let's say G1, GR. So generators of the ideal of X in here. And so the only condition you want to impose on, uh, of course, a morphism from P1 to X is also a morphism from P1 to Pn. And you just want the image to be contained in X. Okay. So you just impose the condition that gi of f not fn is equal to zero for any i. Okay. So inside ud, you impose the condition, uh, now maybe I'll, I want to keep the theorem. Uh, so you want gi of f not fn to be zero for all i. This defines you a subscheme of UD, okay? And this is the, uh, the space of morphisms from P1 to X, okay? So there's, it's not a major difficulty here. And if X is only quasi-projective, then you work a little bit, and, uh, but it's about the same <coughs> a level of difficulty, which is not very high, okay? Okay, so let, uh, let us try to, uh <coughs> so this is an extremely important uh, theorem. And we'll actually be concerned mainly with rational curves. So this is exactly a morphism from P1 to X. So let me take a closer look at rational curves. So rational curves is, is a morphism from... So again, assume, always assume that X is smooth. <coughs> So the important guy, uh, if you read the theorem, the important guy is this, the pullback of the tangent bundle. So this will be, so assume that X has dimension N, the pullback of its tangent bundle to P1 is a locally free sheaf on P1. It turns out that these sheaves are all decomposable, meaning that they all direct sums of invertible sheaves. So we can always write this as, so I guess the, the numbering I take is, like this. <coughs> okay, and so uh, since I have the choice of the order, I I'll always assume that these numbers are ordered like this. Okay? So remember, uh, I mean remember, uh, I never explained, but I, I assume that you know that, that the cohomology of these uh, line models is it's very easy to compute. You can do it by hand, check cohomology. And uh, so maybe I'll just explain that the H1 of O of A, O P1 of A, is zero at, as soon as A is greater than or equal to minus one. 
So in particular, uh, ah, something I forgot to explain, there's a very important subcase of, I mean, a consequence of this theorem. This is the case when the H1 is zero. Okay? So if H1 is zero, which amounts to saying that uh, all these guys here are greater than or equal to minus one. So if an is greater than or equal to minus one with this uh, convention on the uh, ordering of the AIs, we have H1 of rho upper star of Tx equals zero. So this is a very important particular case of the theorem. What happens when H1 is zero? Well, the, the main, uh, the important thing is, is in here, okay? It says that uh, this is defined, the scheme is defined by zero equations in a smooth variety. So it is smooth. More is smooth at the point corresponding to rho. And not only that, but also of dimension The dimension is the H0, and since the H1 vanishes, the uh, H0 is the Euler characteristic. So this is given by the right hand, uh, this value given by um, riemann rock So in our case here, uh, the genus is zero, and so here, well, here it depends on, uh, on, the, on the thing here. Uh, so minus kx dot c, uh, expressed in terms of these numbers is, uh, okay, it's going to be A1 plus An. This is the uh, first term plus the dimension of x. So, we want to impose uh, a stronger condition than this one because it has uh, uh, strong consequences. <coughs> so we want to go one step further. We want all, I want to uh, look at what happens when all the AIs are non-negative. So these curves are very important, and so they have a name. They're called free curves. Definition. So rho, again, uh, x smooth is free. If with the notations uh, over there, a n is non-negative. Okay. In more uh, sort of uh, uh, intrinsic, uh, I mean, you can see that this is equivalent to saying that this guy here is generated by global sections. Or globally generated, I think. This is the x. Uh, it's equivalent. But, uh, okay. So why are these curves very uh, important? Well, it comes from the following calculation. Okay. Mm, let's look at the uh, uh, evaluation map. So it's a map, from, so I don't remember on what side did I put the, uh, it's a map from P1 cross more to X. Okay, so remember this is just a map which takes a point in P1, T, uh, a point in here which is just a a morphism from P1 to X, okay, and uh, you send that to rho of T. This condition here, if you make the computation, so I don't have time to do, to do it here, but it's in the notes, it's uh, extremely, it's completely elementary. Uh, if rho is free, so you compute that rho is free, if and only if, uh, the differential 
of this map evaluation, differential, meaning the tangent map of EV at a point T rho for one or for any T, this is equivalent, is subjective. Okay, so it's just a matter of computing what the uh, tangent map to uh, evaluation is. So the tangent map will be um, a map from between tangent spaces. So here, this is T uh, P1 at some point, plus or cross uh, tangent space to this guy at rho, but we know this. This is just H naught of uh, P1 rho upper star of Tx. And then you want to associate, so this is the tangent map to evaluation, some point at uh, tangent, some, uh, tangent vector to x at the point rho of t. So there's not much choice. Uh, and so in particular, if you take uh, an element in here, uh, a section in here, you just evaluate it at uh, t. Anyway. Uh, I'm not doing this computation. This is the important result here. <coughs> because once you know that the differential of uh, evaluation is subjective, it means that it is dominant. Okay? So in particular, if there is a rational curve, a free rational curve, x is what we call unirolled. Okay, so if there exists a free rational curve, <coughs> x is uniruled. What does it mean? Well, it means ex exactly uh, what this is saying, that there is a, a map like this which is uh, dominant. Okay, so in other words, there exists a morphism which is dominant. Okay, so the if there is a free rational curve, uh, the m here will be, say, the uh, component of this moduli space passing through, through rho. So in, in more concrete terms, what does it mean to be dominant? It means that the image contains an open subset of x, and when is a point in the image? Well, it is a, a, a point in the image when it's the image of uh, some rational curve parameterized by m. So if you want to be a little bit more careful, you don't want to, uh, this map here to contract uh, all the P1s, okay? So you, you, you need to assume uh, something like, uh, not contracted for one M or all M's, it's the same thing. So in other words, X is covered by rational curves. Maybe it's Is this clear? Okay, so these rational curves are just the images uh, I don't know, F uh, F on the, I mean of these morphisms here. So it's sort of a, a striking result. If you manage to find just one rational curve, you know that your variety is covered by rational curves. Okay? And there's a, a, a converse also, but there you have to be a little bit careful. Already here you have to be a little bit careful, but I, I don't want to explain. So the converse would be that what if f is covered by rational curves, 
does it contain a free rational curve? So you want to go backwards. So you're starting from a, a, a map which is dominant like this, <coughs> and so since here we have an, a, an equivalence, you would like to know that the differential is subjective at some point. Okay. So this is exactly saying that uh, a, a dominant morphism like that should be smooth at some point. So this is true in characteristic zero, but not in positive characteristic. So in the sense that if your variety is covered by rational curves, in the sense that there exists a dominant morphism like this, uh, a general curve from that family will be free. Okay, this is generic smoothness. And it's definitely not true in positive characteristic. There are examples of very simple varieties like hypersurfaces in Pn, which are, which are covered by lines. Lines, I mean very simple uh, rational curves, but none of these lines are, are free. Okay. So this is a major uh, a point in the theory. If you're only interested in uh, characteristic zero, then uh, everything is fine. Okay. So free rational curves. Yep. Is it still a, an open complex, the one that is covered by Russian? Uh, it, it, it depends. Uh, actually, uh, if X is smooth and proper, uh, uh, there will be a rational curve through any point. But uh, they're not, they don't come from this family, necessarily. I mean, they can degenerate, but then if a rational curve degenerates, it, it just degenerates in, into uh, rational curves of smaller degrees. Okay. So, so the answer is yes, there, there will be a rational curve through any point, but not necessarily from this family. Yes? My question. If, uh, if all the A's are minus one, then the dimension is zero. If can all I the A's are, uh, yeah? Can I conclude that there are just finitely many rational curves? Uh, here you're dealing with one rational curve, okay? So if, if you have a rational curve where all the A's are, are minus one, it just tells you that this curve is rigid. Okay, this one does not deform, but you might have other curves somewhere else. Okay. So let me give a, a, a quick example. So I, I think you can guess what example it's going to be. It's going to be the, the blow up of Pn at a point. Ah, uh, P2, even more restrictive. So you have a, a particular curve here, which is the exceptional divisor. It's a rational curve. And it's, uh, so if you want to, so here we're looking at the, uh, we want to have the pullback of, which is here just a restriction of the, tangent bundle to P2 uh, restricted to E. So here we have the uh, normal exact sequence. I think I'll write the... And here the normal bundle, which is just OE of E, which and this is uh, OE of minus 1. Okay. The ta so E is just P1, okay? So the tangent bundle is O of 2. And uh, it's easy to check that this ex extension is split. So you have actually you actually have this. So actually, you can never have all the minus ones because there is always the tangent. The tangent bundle to P one is always a sub sub thing in, uh, in here. But anyway, uh, so this is not free. And this is sort of reassuring because uh, everybody knows that the exceptional divisor cannot move, right? And, uh, but you can check uh, as an exercise that any other 
rational curve is free. Sorry? Ah, no, 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 uh, you're right. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. So maybe I should mention also that uh, any rational curve in Pn is also free. So this is one example, maybe, and the other, but it's not very illuminating, any rational curve. It's free, and the fastest way to see, to see that is to, uh, but uh, I need to use uh, terms of which I haven't defined, the tangent bundle to Pn is ample, whatever that means. And so you pull it back to uh, any rational curve, it will still be ample because the morphism is finite. And uh, so you get an ample vector bundle on P1, and then when you, you split it, as I did here, all the AIs are actually positive. Okay. So this is one proof. Okay, so uh, I'm now going into uh, a slightly different direction, but still using uh, these, uh, I mean, there are many more things that you could say about free curves. Uh, for example, uh, free curves have been used by Collar to prove things over uh, fields which are not algebraically closed. There's a beautiful geometry here. So I, I want to go in uh, a different direction, and uh, I want to talk about uh, ban and break lemmas. So these are, um, of course, the work of Murray. So the point of uh, these lemmas is to produce rational curves we want to produce rational curves, rational curves on a smooth, smooth projective. Okay. Well, it's not always possible. If you take uh, an abelian variety, for example, it does not contain any rational curves. Okay, so this won't work all the time. So the, uh, the idea of, of Mori is the following. Uh, even if you don't know that whether your uh, variety X contains rational curves, you know that it contains curves, right? So we start from any curve. So the idea of Mori is, is to deform this uh, curve until the curve C breaks, hence the name, and uh, into several components, one of them uh, should be P1. So uh, to do that, uh, we, uh, I'll, I need to introduce, so I want to look at deformations of rho which fix a point. Okay, so let's say you pick any point C, and uh, so it goes to rho of C. Well, I'm assuming here that the uh, base field is algebraically closed, but any characteristic, this is important. And I want to look at morphisms, uh, deformations of C, so in this uh, modelized space more, which keep sending C to X. So let me, uh, it's not difficult to see that these are parameterized by a, a sub-scheme of this guy here, which I'll denote by uh, something like this. I mean, or rho of X. This is easy to define uh, as a subscheme, and uh, so let me write. Uh, I guess the uh, so I said lemmas here, but I think they deserve more than. Uh, they're not very difficult to prove. 
But since I didn't explain anything about uh, surfaces, I'm not, I cannot prove them here. So X projective, smooth is actually not necessary, but uh, so rho, a curve as usual, so C is, is, uh, is smooth, and uh, C as above. Assume that you can deform this curve. So in other words, assume that the dimension of this guy here uh, sending C to rho of C, so the dimension at the point rho is greater than or equal to 1, okay, then there exists a rational curve uh, on x passing through rho of c. Okay. So the drawing is, uh, is the following. You have your curve here, and it, there's this uh, point x. So you know by hypothesis that uh, you can move this curve. Okay, so you deform it. So this is the original c or rho of C. So you deform it and uh, the Ben and Break lemma tells you that something's going to break at some point, okay? And you're going to have something like this. And this one is going to be rational. So, uh, of course, we have a, this hypothesis here and The thing is that we have a lower bound for the dimension of this guy, and it's easy to see that the codimension in here can't be more than the dimension of x. Okay? So altogether, the lower bound that I explained on the dimension of this guy here implies that the dimension of this is uh, at least mm, minus kxc plus, uh, let me see, no minus g of c dim of x plus 1. Okay. So if we manage to uh, find a, a curve for, for which this number here is uh, greater than or equal to 1, then we'll have a rational curve. So you can see, for example, that on, on an abelian variety, this is 0, so you never get anywhere. You'll never get anywhere of this, which is as it should. Okay, so this is uh, the main thing. What we are going to do is uh, look at situations where this number is uh, at least positive, but also very large, so that it becomes larger than this. I want to state the second band and break. So th it it's, uh, sounds more uh, impressive, but it's, uh, you have to it's indispensable also. So it says the following, that it, it starts from the assumption <coughs> is uh, that you already have a rational curve. So assume that you have a rational curve. So I'm always assuming this is non-constant, right? Otherwise. And assume now that the dimension of the space of morphisms from P1 uh, 2x fixing two points, so for example 0 and infinity. Since this is, this is P1, you can always pick any two points that you like on P1. Assume that this is greater than or equal to 2. Okay. It's always at least 1 because you have automorphisms of P1 fixing 0 and infinity. Okay. But you assume that it's larger than what it should be. Then. So let me put it this way, uh, rho of P1, the curve, the original curve, how did I phrase it here? Uh, let's see, can be, uh, this is a bit vague, okay? It can be deformed in the union, in a, in a connected union, of at least 
two rational curves passing through these same uh, points. Okay, so what it means on uh, it means the following. So you have your, your curve, your original curve, passing through these two points, rho of zero, rho of infinity. And the fact that this hypothesis here means that you can deform the curve, but not stupidly by just reparameterizing the curve, but actually the curve moves on x, okay? So it moves, and again it's going to break into at least two, two components. Okay? Something is going to break. So here I, I drew three components. It might be actually just uh, one component, but with, uh, yeah, so this is a little bit imprecise. Um, it might be one component with multiplicity two. Okay, let, let's forget about this. So, uh, what do we do with this? And so again, we have a lower bound on. Uh, the dimension of this space uh, analogous, analog to, um, to this one. So these uh, lemmas can be used to prove, uh, I think Maurice says it was his, his main achievement following theorem. <coughs> so x smooth projective uh, with k a minus kx ample. So this is called a fan of variety. Any x is uniruled. There's a more precise statement in the notes. OK, I have three minutes to prove this. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just uh, give you the idea. OK, so this is the important lower bound, and I don't want to erase it. I mean, the proof is really amazing. So since uh, minus kx is ample, at least we know that this number here is positive, okay? It has positive degree on any curve, but it might not be large enough. So the trick is to uh, first do the case of positive characteristic. And you start from any curve. And you want to show that it deforms, okay? Well, it might not be possible just by uh, applying this theorem with C, but since you are in positive characteristic, uh, there's this miraculous map which is called Frobenius. So this is the composition of uh, Frobenius maps. And the miracle about uh, Frobenius maps is that they don't change the, the genus. So CM and C are basically the same curve, but this covering here has positive degree. It has degree P to the M. Okay, so, so the characteristic is P. Okay. So you see, this is uh, essential because now we're going to apply uh, the proposition not to rho, but to the composition of these two. What have we gained by doing this? Well, we haven't changed the genus, so this term here uh, remains the same, but this number here is actually multiplied by the degree of the map we've composed with. Okay. So of course, since this is positive for m large enough, you will have a uh, positive lower bound, which means that you can apply the proposition so the curve that deforms will not be rho, it will be the morphism, this composed morphism here, but it will still produce by the proposition uh, a rational curve through uh, any point actually of the original curve. Okay? Since rho was arbitrary, you can take 
uh, your curve C to pass, to pass through any given point that you like. Okay? So the conclusion by the proposition is that there exists. So here we, we can take any point and we can assume that uh, the curve you choose passes through this point. So there is a rational curve through any point. So x is unirule, then this already proves the theorem in characteristic p. How do you pass through uh, uh, characteristic 0? OK, so let me uh, go quickly here. So assume for simplicity that so your variety x is a, is a sub-variety of pn, because it's a projective variety. So it's defined by equations. Uh, certain number of equations which have a certain number of coefficients. Assume that these coefficients are in Q, and since they are projective equations, we can always assume that they are in Z. Okay. So this is not always true. Okay? I'm assuming this to uh, make the, the proof a little bit simpler, but the general proof is completely analogous. Okay? So now we reduce these equations mod P. And we get something uh, xp, maybe. OK, so for some p's, uh, this variety will be singular, or maybe not fano, or anything. But for most p's, for infinity many p's, this reduction here will be smooth and uh, with a minus uh, k example. So we can apply uh, the first case to xp. Okay, So it means that there is a rational curve to any point. Any FP point. Sorry, I'm going to take three minutes, uh, three more minutes. So there is a rational curve on the reduction uh, through any point. How to lift this curve? Well, the trick is, is to use the space more that I defined at the beginning. And so it turns out, this is very easy to check, that the space of morphisms from P1 to X is actually, uh, since X is defined over Z in this equation, in this example, this guy is also defined over z. Okay? It's, it's not hard to believe, because if you remember, this is defined inside a uh, projective space by equations which came from the equations of x. Okay? So this is defined over z. And uh, somehow, the, there's in spec z, there's a generic point. And over this generic point, the fiber is the space of morphisms from P1Q to XQ. Okay? Uh, actually, we can go over uh, even a higher extension, our original field K. Okay? So here we have, you have some geometric point. So this is sort of a uh, generic, uh, geometric generic fiber of this morphism here. What do we know from uh, this story here? We know that over most close points here, over most p, infinity many p's, there is a point. Okay? Because the rational curve on xp means a point of this space over p. Okay? So here you have some point. But now there is some uh, a general principle that the image of this guy in spec Z is a constructible subset. Okay? And if a constructible subset contains, is dense, which is the case here because it contains infinitely many primes, then it contains a generic point. Okay? So in other words, so this is really uh, Grothendieck uh, yeah? <laughs> stuff. I, in other words, the, the, the generic fiber is non-empty. And since it's, it is non-empty, it has a point over any algebraically closed field. Okay? 
So there is a point in here, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Okay. So now you might ask, what about the second? Uh, why did I prove this second Ben and Break lemma? Does anybody know? Everybody, anybody know? There's a hidden uh, thing in here which I. Uh, this space is not. Uh, it's not quasi-projective. It has infinitely many components. Okay? If you have infinitely many components, you understand that you cannot deduce anything because maybe uh, the point above P, each P has a point in a different component. And then, then of course, you cannot deduce anything. So you, you use the second banana break lemma to limit the degree of the curve. So in other words, you prove that you have a point in uh, a fixed quasi-projective piece of this guy and then you do the reasoning that I just did. Okay? So, sorry, I'll stop here.